Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here at Media Days. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, this workshop. Uh, it's because it's so, it's so interesting to do a workshop in three completely different um, interactive contexts. Uh, so without further ado, let's kind of get into uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, though I guess there'll be a little bit of a do. Let me introduce myself uh, a little bit more. Uh, as, uh, as mentioned, I am a researcher and a developer of uh, collaborative, collaborative uh, immersive platforms. Um, but in addition to that, I also, uh, I work a lot with cultural heritage and education uh, in VR. So um, here in Istanbul, we, we, uh, we have an interesting market um, because we, we have such a rich cultural history um, and there's often a lot of uh, a demand to see that virtualized. So this is an area that I work in uh, quite often uh, as a developer, but as a researcher, I spend more time looking at how people are working together and platforms. And this actually predated uh, the, the pandemic lockdowns, but it really, my work really accelerated during the lockdowns. Uh, and uh, that's has been through the XR crowd and specifically the zero events. And the zero events have been a series of explorations of social and collaborative platforms, mostly immersive, but not all of them uh, strictly immersive. Uh, and by immersive, I mean wearing a headset and feeling you are in another another place. Um, and here are some screenshots of different meetings, different types of events that we've done uh, with professionals from our industry uh, in platforms like Rec Room and Meet in VR, Engage, Neos, and Arthur. And I'm going to talk more about these platforms and others, uh, and as well as I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk more about what we've done and, and what you know I think. Uh, after so many months of, of testing and, and uh, insights that we gained as a community, what I think you can practically do in these platforms, uh, particularly with uh, different different use cases in mind. I'll talk about different use cases. Um, and then about my university lab. So my university lab, uh, which I'm the coordinator of, is based in Istanbul at Coach University. And we, we train, we consult, uh, and we develop, uh, most often in the fields of cultural heritage, uh, wellness, uh, psychology, and art. Um, and these are examples of student projects that came out of our first training program, uh, which was, uh, which, which began when the lab began uh, just about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now, uh, with support from the Istanbul uh, Development Agency. So uh, when people think about immersive or VR events and conferences, this is an example of what they're thinking of. Uh, this is a screenshot from an event that took place earlier this year. One of the first events to be virtualized properly, um, immersively, uh, after the lockdowns and after most physical events were being canceled. This was the XR Base Investor event. It took place in the platform Engage. This was part of Laval Virtual uh, 2020. And it, it has a number of features which is relevant uh, for this discussion. Uh, and particularly for members of the audience who I know are in attendance. Uh, here we have a, an idealized architecture. It's an amphitheater in the middle of what is either San Francisco Bay or you know, some other type of uh, really iconic imagery that, that isn't a real place, it's not a physical location. Uh, and the architecture here is not a real location. It, it doesn't exist in this, in this form anywhere physically, but it is, uh, been created here virtually and the purpose of it is to create a a pleasing visual context for what is a very traditional present uh, series of uh, presentations these events which we see being virtualized before and now uh now still are very much one-to-one -one translations of of traditional physical events uh you attend it there are seats uh, usually you can sit down in those seats. Uh, Engage is one of the platforms that lets you sit, which is surprisingly not that common in a lot of platforms, despite the fact that it's, it's really conducive uh, to the experience of, of talking and of attending uh, events. And uh, there's a stage. Here we have a panel, but in many cases it's, it's, a, it's a speaker on stage and they, they have their hands being tracked, so they're gesturing um, as they're speaking. They have some facial animations, but but for 99% of the people in the room who are in the audience, 
uh, it's a very passive experience, uh, much more passive than even the platform allows. The platform allows more than that. But virtualizing conferences um, ten, it, it still is very traditional. Uh, and we've kind of learned that that's not a great user experience. It's not a great way to virtualize. Um, and then with regard to the space, the space itself is what we would call window dressing. You know, it, it's it's there and it's meant to look nice. It make you feel like very professional or it's very techy or it's very, um, you know, glamorous. But but it doesn't serve much more purpose than that. The space do, isn't isn't an, an interactive or essential part, really, of, of the experience. And uh, fortunately, we're starting to see that change. We're starting to see more interesting use of space. And uh, uh, one example of that is uh, the Venice International Film Festival, uh, which in September, so last month, now a month and a half ago, they, for the first time, uh, took their content out of Venice. Uh, not the whole festival, but the Venice VR expanded program specifically. Uh, and they migrated into VR chat. And uh, I'll, as I, I'll talk uh, over this video. Now, the, the, the purpose of the space in, in here was actually meant not to be window dressing. It was actually meant to reconstruct that experience that was, was lost through the virtualizing. Um, and so they recreated parts of Venice and you ride a gondola through it. They have this uh, exhibition hall, um, which again, does not correlate to a physical location, though it's inspired by physical location, certainly. Um, but it's very much uh, this fantastical world that's inspired by, by the, the island uh, in the lagoon of Venice, where the, the festival typically takes place. Um, and Compared to something like Engage, um, their use of space was intended to recreate the experience of being in a really active, dynamic, social place. Um, and to that extent, they, they were really quite um, successful. Here are screenshots of the, the meeting, the presentations, the pitching, the you know, meet the directors and, uh, and maybe uh, investor meetings, uh, all took place in this, this virtual space. And you can see from the top and you can see from other angles, um, you know, this space was not meant to be window dressing so much as it was meant to be inspiring, you know, really, really to enhance the sense of creativity. Um, and uh, in addition to the space, the avatars, you'll notice that the avatars, which are the, the bodies that all the users are, are using here that to represent themselves, they're wildly different, whereas in Engage, they're much more, uh, much more human. They're a very, very standard, very limited uh, array of uh, edits you can make and customizations you can make there, uh, because they're looking for different, um, different types of experiences to facilitate. Um, and so, in immersive socializing, it's really important that you allow people to uh, have some control over the way they look, but you also want to make use of the space to further and, and really promote um, the discussion and the socializing. So there are many props uh, that are available in virtual worlds and in VR chat, and specifically in this place, we have these uh, Venetian masks, which were used for no other purpose than as conversation starters. You know, just props to, and uh, they, were, they, were, they were drinks, and the drinks would change the way you see the world. You know, things like this, uh, we're really designed for fueling interaction uh, between users. And we're starting to see that more and it's important that we see that more. Uh, because when you virtualize an event, you need to focus on what's, what's most value creating for the user's experience. And it tends not to be the static presentation. It tends to be more um, the interactions that they have with others. So now, Broadly speaking, those two events, the differences between the XR Base Investor event and the Venice uh, VR Expanded event, you can tie directly to the type of audience and the type of purpose um, that they were serving. The first one is very much a, a business, very business-y um, setting, and the audience were investors and entrepreneurs, and uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a sense that everyone needs to look a certain way. Um, and the presentation is very much uh, incorporating a power. 
yeah, obviously the person on stage is demanding of attention and is more important at that moment, but obviously also the investors in the room, um, they, they have power. That's what everybody, they have what everybody wants, which is of course the funding and support. Whereas in a, a Venice VR festival, uh, it's about creatives, you know, and there's a sense of uh, equality there. That, that's what they're trying to establish because they're looking to collaborate. They're looking to find opportunities with each other um, and to share with one another. And um, those two different types of audiences and different types of motivations reflect themselves very much in the decisions that they chose to make about the space and about what their audiences, their attendees could do in those events, in those platforms. The platforms themselves share a lot of similar functionality. They, you could have interchanged them to some extent, not, not fully because the avatars and engage don't have the, the variety that VR chat allows. But generally speaking, if you really wanted to, you could have done one event in the other platform. You could have interchanged them a bit. But, um, but for some things like working together, professionally working together with the, the objective to create tangible artifacts of collaboration, whether it be like a new diagram or a new framework or some type of notation and annotation of, of, um, of models and visualizations, then you do need a dedicated platform that is, is providing you those functions because these are more advanced functions. And you need a platform like uh, Arthur. This is a, a screenshot of a workshop that we did through Zero Event. Uh, this was a series of workshops actually discussing virtual conferences uh, and what a virtual conference, you know, the different elements, the different stakeholders, the challenges and the, the opportunities presented by virtualizing. And, you know, in, in a nutshell, many of the insights that came out, of course, were the same ones we had been discussing in our community for, for several months at this point, which is, when I go to an event physically, the person on stage, you know, is fine. And, you know, the, the, the matchmaking, the, the meetings that I, that I schedule, those are, those are fine too. Those are, those are both valuable, but definitely what's more important to me, to my experience uh, and my ability to create value by attending are things like the cafe. Uh, and maybe the hallways that I'm going to walk from one event to other where I might walk with someone I just met or I might run into someone who, you know, I've, I've met them before, but, you know, I don't know them so well. And this is an opportunity to build that relationship or it's someone completely new that just by, by chance, uh, I have this opportunity to build a relationship with. Uh, the term that is most appropriate here is serendipity. Um, and serendipity is a, is a component of most physical events, not because the, the, the organizers of those events are trying to facilitate that. It's just what happens when you, when you put a lot of people into a, a shared space. Um, so we identified in this that if someone was going to virtualize an event or a conference or a festival, well, you know, in a virtual environment, you do have to uh, explicitly attempt to facilitate that type of serendipitous experience. Um, and not only because that's a really valuable component of it, but in some ways it's actually the selling point, um, that you, that, uh, more and more experienced audiences who've attended more and more virtual events will come to realize that I need to have the sense that something unexpected and uh, unexpectedly positive is going to happen if I attend this event. You know, right now, what we have with a lot of uh, online events with webinars and stuff, you know exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get a presentation or a video or something. Um, there, there's, no, there's no unknown or there's very little unknown about it. And the unknown factor allows us to get excited. And we can say, I, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. It could be something good. You know, I could really surprise myself or be surprised. Um, and that's, again, something that a virtual, platform, a virtual conference organizer has to try to facilitate, and the platform has to allow that. Um, and most of these platforms do allow that. But, uh, but getting back to what a, a true collaborative platform like Arthur allows, um, it allows us to discuss these types of abstract concepts and represent them dynamically with each other in space. 
where we, we could do this physically with note taking, with post-it notes, sticky notes. We could, we could have objects that we could move around, we could have whiteboards we can draw. Um, but these platforms give us that ability too, uh, which is great when we can't do that physically. Uh, so Arthur is an example of a platform that's really quite a sophisticated collaboration tool. Uh, I'm going to play a, a quick video of another meeting uh, platform called Meet in VR. And uh, you'll see that it's not as sophisticated in what it allows you to do compared to something like Arthur, but you'll see very much what they consider to be the essential functions for this type of collaboration. Uh, drawing, sketching, writing on whiteboards, drawing in space, uh, illustrating points through some type of uh, visual, note-taking with sticky notes, um, placing them dynamically around the space. Now, you don't control the space in this environment, and in typ typically speaking, in collaborative environments, you don't control the space. The space is provided to you. Uh, you can customize it as a company, but as a user, you're not changing much with it. The space, again, is really much more of a of window dressing, to be, again, to be, to be fair to them. what What's important for collaborative platforms are the tools um, that you can use yourself and with others in that space, and the space itself is not so critical. Um, and I'm going to have a list later of the type of functions that a platform like Meet and VR utilizes or Arthur um, that can be really important to make that uh, successful meetings. A different type of platform, which was not designed for collaboration per se, but ultimately has come to be a very powerful collaborative platform is, is Rec Room. And the reason I show Rec Room, Rec Room is a platform for, originally for gaming, social gaming. It's a social VR gaming platform. Um, it's, a, it's a very sophisticated platform from a technical standpoint. It's very stable um, and Everything is built in world. Everything is done in world. Um, and they allowed a couple of years ago users to begin, create, to begin creating their own content using 3D objects. I mean, not uploading, but making the 3D objects in that environment. Uh, and as they have built that out, uh, it has gone from a gaming platform into a creative platform. And once you have multiple people able to create, well, then inherently it becomes a, a creative collaboration platform. Uh, and we've done workshops in there to that point. Uh, you have just what you see in some of the other, uh, the other platforms I just showed, Meet and VR and, and Arthur to some extent. You have uh, notes, you have whiteboards. Uh, but what you have here that you don't have in the others is you have something like a maker pen. You have a specialized tool for creating objects in three-dimensional objects in space with others, you can do it in the same room with others. You can add in Rec Room logic. You can add scripting. There is a scripting engine that's continuing to develop in there. You can have progressively more sophisticated behaviors, dynamic and, and pre-programmed behaviors that you can give to objects and give to events. Um, and instead of just building objects, you're also able to build worlds. You're, you're able to build architecture. There are very large reproductions of, of real world objects and of course fantastical structures in, in platforms like this and you can collaborate with others to make it. So again, despite the fact that it was not intended for that purpose, Rec Room might be, well, I would say not might be, it's definitely one of the two or three most uh, powerful collaboration tools for creatives and for, for creation in general, prototyping uh, in particular. Um, another platform that has some interesting functionality that you don't see very much, but I think might be particularly interested, interesting for architects in our audience, uh, is the wild. And the wild is very similar, uh, quite frankly, to, um, to other collaborative platforms. The avatars aren't so great, but what we see here, you can create objects dynamically using primitives. So it has some of the creative ability of Rec Room, um, it has notate, notations, you can create uh, notes because uh, you're, you're visualizing spaces. You can decide that you know, something needs to change, you can, you can export that, um, and then you can, whoever is building a model can either change that in a dedicated modeling software or change it inside the wild. Um, and in this space, I wanted to draw particular attention to, and I'm hoping that this is where they show it, yeah. So, 
what the wild allows you to do that other platforms really don't, with the exception of, of VR chat in this one particular case, and Neos actually, and Neos as well, is allows different people to be at completely different scales. Um, and that's a fascinating design functionality that I don't, I don't know how practically useful it is. Um, but having experienced it, it it's, it's fascinating, if nothing else. It, it, it gives you a, a very different perspective of objects and structures that you're building. Again, in this case, it's an architectural design and visualization tool. So they're not really using it for, for products per se, they're using it for structures. And what, what I mean by different perspectives, as we saw here, we had a handful of people who were larger than the structure, looking down at the structure. But as it zooms in, in real time, there are people in there. So you can have people who are editing the structure while people are inside the structure editing and changing the design inside. Um, and again, it's fascinating. Uh, I don't know how practically useful it is to have people at different, at completely different scales working on a, a shared object at the same time. But um, you could see that in this case, if you're building progressively, uh, you know, larger and larger um, spaces, urban spaces, um, this could be quite powerful. You could see what it looks like to, to have a view from a park while looking from, you know, a definitely a much more macroscopic perspective, what, what the whole layout of, of this, um, this neighborhood uh, might be. So that's something that VR allows you to do that nothing else allows you to do, to my knowledge, uh, in this way. Um, and so that, that's one particular function that makes the wild a really fascinating uh, tool and it's changing with, you know, it's experimenting with perspective. Um, and other platforms can do this, but, uh, but the wild is the one that really does it. So we've been looking at these exhibitions and these conferences and festivals, which were created and kind of transplanted into VR. Um, and then we looked at platforms like Rec Room that allow you to build in VR. Um, and more and more, I think we're going to be seeing, uh, events that were built in VR, not brought in, but built you know, in a dedicated sense to VR. Uh, and here is a platform, this is a, a screenshot uh, taken of a world that was built in a platform called Neos. And as I said, Rec Room is probably definitely one of the two or three most powerful creative platforms right now uh, that are immersive, that are, you know, that are VR. Uh, and Neos is almost certainly the most powerful uh, presently what you can do inside. This was built in the platform. The objects were uploaded to a large extent. It doesn't, I don't, Neos doesn't allow you to uh, maybe create as much. You can create with primitives in there, but maybe not with the same ease of Rec Room. But in Rec Room, you can't upload your own objects that were created outside, but in Neos, you can. You can upload essentially anything. Um, and you can create very large scale worlds in here. Um, another platform that, is allowing you to build um, real, you know, real events and bring them in is, is Sansar. So you have a difference between, again, building in the platform or building outside and bringing it in. And inherently, we see this difference. Um, and I, I can switch back maybe. As beautiful as this is, this has a, a clear aesthetic um, because the platform inherently is some type of constraint. Neos is not as constrained in this sense as like Rec Room is, but still, uh, it, it really struggles to come to the same level of lighting quality, um, and for, you know, model fidelity that is possible when you use traditional tools to create these things and then import them in. Uh, this is a platform called Sansar, and this was an uh, artistic exhibition of Burning Man art. It was called No Spectators. Uh, it's still available in Sansar, which is a free platform. It's a platform designed for holding events, particularly ticketed events. They, they want you to sell tickets and make, they want, they want event organizers to make money organizing events in Sansar. Um, and they have their own renderer, unlike some of the other platforms that are working off of Unity or something. Um, and as you can see, it's a very powerful renderer. Uh, you can really get into particular details. This room uh, in particular is available in this exhibition and uh you know it's it's a really fascinating recreation of a, of a real installation but it's also quite indicative of what you could do um 
you know, how far you can go uh, with texturing and with lighting effects in this platform. And all these, you don't see it here, but when you're in a headset, when you're in this space, uh, all of this text is legible. You know, that's part of this thing is that there are all these little handwritten messages that are spread about uh, this, this exhibition and all that's, all that is readable. Um, and that's, uh, again, very powerful. But I think the future will be a little bit less of building in traditional platforms and loading it in, not because this isn't a great way to do it. It is a great way to do it, but this requires multiple skills now. Um, it requires knowing the tools, the traditional tools, and then knowing this platform. And I think what we're going to see more of is people building in these platforms. As these platforms allow more and more building, there are going to be people who are just experts of NEOs. Uh, and, and we have those. We have people who are experts of NEOs more than they're experts of anything else. Um, and, uh, and, and progressively Rec Room uh, right now, I think. Those are the two main platforms. There's another platform called Anyland, but unfortunately, it's just not funded enough. But, um, but what NEOs is becoming... Uh, or may already be, is basically an engine, uh, uh, and, and a game engine that exists in VR. And so what you can do is you can be adding functionality to these objects. So what this person's doing, he's got this box and he's got you know these, these UI controls. He's actually building the functionality to open doors in here. And this is quite trivial, but, but this is also fundamental interaction. Um, the, the things that you can go beyond that, of course, are much more. You can do a lot of dynamic um, object behaviors, a lot of uh, dynamic scripting. You can, and NEOS allows you to plug into third-party sensors uh, and other tools and peripherals. So you can um, dynamically be changing objects um, on the basis of input coming from outside that platform, outside that, that user. Um, and again, that can be really quite powerful if you want to build an exhibition, a hybrid exhibition, which we're seeing, again, some, some events are going towards hybrid, where there is a physical event, but there's also a virtual event, but they don't want them to be disconnected. They want them to interact. And the way that they can interact, quite frankly, you have to have sensors that are providing information about the real experience to the virtual experience. Um, and a platform like Neos actually supports that type of uh, input, uh, and much more so than other platforms in this, uh, in this category. Um, so coming back to building uh, and collaboration more particularly, and looking again at NEOS, NEOS does something which a lot of platforms don't do. I haven't seen, I've only seen one other platform, I think Glue, do a little something like it, but not to the same level. NEOS allows you to share your control panels, your menus, the, the user interface you're working with. It's almost always private to you and every one of these platforms. But NEOS allows you to choose to share it so that others can see it. And what's important about this is that most other platforms allow you to collaborate with others by building something and then showing it to them. It means if you don't build it very well or, or you struggle to do it, no one can help you really in that process. You just have to know the platform and that workflow. It also means that the conversation doesn't start until you've already put your mind toward and, and dedicated your resources to completing the construction of something tangible, like a note or a 3D object of some type. But when you can share your menu, you can be collaborating with others in the actual creative process of generating that tangible object. And, uh, and that's something that, again, it begins the conversation that you have with others. It begins the, the collaboration a, a step earlier. Uh, and that's very powerful. Uh, and I, I like to bring attention to that because I think it's really innovative that NEOS allows it. It's quite simple, um, but it's, 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 I think, still very unique. I don't know anyone else doing it. Uh, and it's a potentially very powerful tool uh, for collaborative uh, creation. So summarizing some of these platforms that we've been, we've been talking about, I'm working, this is, this is still in development. It's quite preliminary. Um, I'm trying to arrange them on uh, two, two dimensions, which is their scalability, how easy it is to implement them and how many people can be concurrently uh, involved in a session. Um, and then just how sophisticated they are interactively. 
what you can do with others and what you can do creatively in that platform. And, uh, and I, I feel fairly confident about, you know, this arrangement. Um, and uh, you'll notice that some platforms are really interactive and they tend not to be super scalable. And then some are very scalable, but they're, you know, again, conversely, not very, that, not very interactive. And we have a lot of innovation coming in these platforms here, which are, even if some of them have been around a little while, a few years, so that they're not really that new, they're not quite fully mature yet. Uh, these are B2B platforms, so which is one of the reasons why they're not quite as mature as some of the platforms which are more social and consumer oriented because um, the platforms that go for more uh, social audiences, consumer audiences, they have to be, I wouldn't say more stable, they, they have to get down to the fundamental essence of what they're offering. So Neos and Rec Room have very powerful uh, uh, backends, you know, very strong frameworks for creation. And Sansar has also gone that direction. Uh, it's a, quite a powerful tool. Whereas the B2Bs, they're, they're still kind of finding um, their, their specific use cases and niche and, and dialing in on what functions their clients really want for that. Um, and until recently, that's been difficult for them because there haven't been so many clients. Um, not that they don't have clients, but the adoption practically of these immersive uh, tools for collaboration, socializing, wasn't anywhere near as active last year as it is now. Uh, the entire environment has changed and really accelerated this process of development. And uh, so we're seeing a lot more, I would say, new platforms emerging uh, in this space. There's a couple that aren't on this list that we've been testing for zero events. And uh, this is an area to watch because you kind of expect that eventually these platforms here in the middle will start to move either up uh, or out to the right as, and become more scalable. Um, and it just, they're, you know, as they find their, their place in the market uh, and these more, these older ones, because these are all older, these platforms, um, they're kind of oriented where they're going to be. They, you know, they're either ultimately very sophisticated or very scalable and that's, you know, they're just kind of seeing, hoping that their established position um, gives them this advantage as this marketplace continues to develop and new competitors are, are entering the space. But, um, but I definitely encourage everyone to try as many of these as you can uh, because uh, no two platforms are the same. They're all slightly different, even if they're targeting almost exactly the same crowd. The most the platforms that are most directly competing will share a lot of, they will share a lot, but when you get into the experience itself and look at it, they often don't share what they should be sharing. You know, they, one platform does something really well and another platform doesn't copy it. Well, you know, and, and why don't they? So, and things like that are like locomotion, how you move around a space. Some of these platforms really, uh, there's one that wasn't on that list, it's called Wrong. It's quite new. Uh, it's not out yet, but, uh, but they're beta testing it. And they, they want to have space be something you cannot uh, cheat your way out of. Going back to this serendipity, you know, that, that I'm, there's the unexpected um, that may happen because I'm in this place with other people. They really want that. They want, they, they're designing a space, which is not huge, but it's large enough that you need to take some effort to go to the other side of your, your venue. Um, and it's kind of a fantastical setting in a tropical sea, but, um, but your office venue, um, they make you have to take time, teleport, hop basically over to where you want to go for your, for your next meeting or for this, where this particular functionality is. And, um, instead of being able to do that immediately, quickly or with a you know, click of a button, I'm going to suddenly be in this other room. They want you to have to go there, travel there. And the reason they want you to do that is because they want you to have the chance that maybe you're going to meet a colleague along that way and say hi. And maybe that colleague is going to tell you something that you would not have heard if you hadn't run into that person on the path uh, to, to your, your next meeting. Um, and, you know, and it's curious. A, a few platforms go that route where they really emphasize the use of space. Um, and, and they do it a little bit more ideologically than others. But, but 
some platforms really don't care about that. Some platforms want small venues. They really, they want, uh, they're not using space very much, actually. It's quite a stationary experience. Um, on that same note, the platforms that have a lot of stationary experiences, they let you sit down on a chair, whereas other platforms that don't want you, that, that, you know, they want motion, they want activity, they don't let you sit down on chairs. They may have chairs. The, the chairs will be there, but they're not functional. They're just window dressing. And as a user, that can be really frustrating. Why there's a chair, but I can't use it. I can't sit down in that chair. And uh, aside from being just kind of topical, um, there's two elements of that. One, sitting down in a chair with somebody is a really effective way of communicating you're committed to this conversation. Uh, and and that's, that fact is not super valued um, always by these platforms. But it's really important. If I want to have a dedicated talk with someone, a chat, and, and when I'm standing in VR and I'm kind of moving back and forth, like there's always this element that I could walk away, you know, or hop away. And, and the seated part really, um, really helps alleviate that, that anxiety socially that perhaps this person, you know, this is quite, you know, unstable, this person could be gone. But the other element, uh, and perhaps more important for people who are designing these spaces, is you have things, you have objects that suggest a functionality that you're not providing. And that's a major issue of all VR. Whenever you're simulated in, in simulating real world environments in VR, when you have something that suggests something that it isn't actually going to, deli to deliver, that creates uh, a disappointment uh, in, in the user. And I often tell people, don't put anything in there that doesn't work. And uh, if, if, if you need to have it in there for some reason and working is not effective or, or, or not, not essential, it's still make it work. You don't have to have people sit in that chair, but at least let them do that. Um, and not a, a, many of these platforms don't do that. Uh, and that creates some annoyance when people go from one platform to another and they're comparing their experiences. Avatar selection is another big one. Um, I think you've maybe if you've seen these pictures and screenshots, all the avatars are different. Um, and that also creates a significant anxiety. And there's a major reason why certain people like certain platforms and certain platforms are great fits for certain events. And then um, note taking, which Meet in VR does a great job with and almost every other platform does not. Uh, most platforms have virtual keyboards. Virtual keyboards is like with a controller, like you push one by one keys um, to write messages, uh, to write notes. And uh, that's, that's not ideal. That's not great. Um, in fact, it's, it's almost universally hated. There's just not a better alternative to it. The alternative is to write, uh, and that's hard to do when you don't have a hard surface. Um, even if you have whiteboards, like it, it's not easy to use whiteboards and um, many of these platforms use them, um, but many users don't use them effectively. Um, but what Meet in VR does is allows you to do uh, speech to text. Uh, and that's critical. That's a huge advantage that that platform has. And at least one other platform uh, that I know of has it, but it's quite rare. Uh, and more voice commands would be looked upon very favorably uh, for designers. And some platforms allow you to do that, like Neos would allow you to do voice commands. Um, but, you know, not natively, you've got to build that if you're a designer or a creator. Um, so here's just a list of what I think, and it's a growing list of essential elements of these, these, um, events and collaboration platforms that you would want to see present. Uh, I'm not going through all of them because we talked about most of them, but one we didn't talk about, which is it has to be there is spatial audio. When you're working with space, the, audio, uh, the, the speech of others, the, the music coming out of speakers or whatever, um, it needs to reflect that space. It needs to behave in a logical manner. Uh, and almost every platform has spatial audio. Most of them don't have it functioning very well in terms of the drop off is not what you what it should be. Um, and many of them don't give you control over the audio. Uh, as a user, and they should. Those that do, like VR chat, it's really helpful. They give you multiple audio channels. 
um, and you can make use of that as you need. You can have ambient noise, you can have uh, object related noise, world environmental noise, as well as ambience, and then you can have spoken speech um, channels. And all of that is essential. So, um, you know, I think this, this will be available later for those who are interested. Um, and like I said, it's a growing list. And I think we're going to talk more about these uh, in the next section of this workshop. Um, but I'm going to end with just this one example of something that I found really exciting, not, not rocket science by any stretch of the imagination, but very exciting for someone who, like myself, um, works with VR largely because AR tools, AR headsets are just not available uh, in, a, in a very useful way. Uh, you know, the HoloLens is just not quite what it needs to be. So the video is performing poorly, unfortunately. But what this guy did, this Greg Madison, he, he recreated his home one-to-one -one, down to scale and location, which um, in this case, he did it manually. You know, he just measured out the specifics. But here he's using hand tracking. And when you, this is now mixed reality. So this is not purely virtual reality. Uh, this is a mixed reality experience in the sense that he has now given advanced functionalities to every object in his home. Uh, he's given, you know, um, pull-up maps on tables. He's given um, kind of a web browser for sheet music uh, on the wall above his keyboard. Um, and he's given uh, controls. And again, I'm trying to get the video to point right where it needs to be. Yeah, he can use gesture controls to turn on the TV. Of course, the real TV is not on, but the virtual TV is. You know, it's, I wouldn't say this is a great experience. Um, it could be. But what I would, what I do think is that this is an incredible way to design environments and, um, and objects for a future when AR headsets uh, and, and immersive augmented reality uh, will be present. This is a great way to design the, the type of interactions, the type of um, tools and functions you need for it. Um, so I, I find this video really inspiring. Um, and it's something that a colleague of mine uh, is working on at Coach University, and, and I'm supporting him with that. So I, I like to share that with, uh, with anyone who's on the design side. And, uh, and, and that's it. So we covered a lot, and I hope it was, was useful. I hope um, definitely, the uh, members of the audience who, who've seen this presentation now will be able to go out and try some of these platforms uh, or attend some of the events and, and attend those events in their immersive components. Many events now will have a Mozilla Hubs component, uh, like where we're going to in our, our next phase, or an Altspace component, which is in our, our third phase today. Uh, but then sometimes they're doing it in, in completely other platforms that aren't on that list. Um, and they're worth, they're worth experimenting with, worth experiencing and seeing what it has to offer. So thank you very much uh, for, for all your time this morning. I think that's where we're going to finish it. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll take a break. <laughs>